Welcome to Seed to Story, a podcast where I get firsthand stories from people immersed in the culture and industries of food. Introducing Renee Kelly as our first guest. So, Renee Kelly, you're the first person on our Seed to Story podcast. Oh, goodness. And um, I'm just kind of want to know like, where you're from, like how, where you grew up, and like. My bit. wild and crazy story. Sure. Um, I'm born and raised in Kansas City, uh, closer to DeSoto than uh, Kansas City. I'm the youngest and the only girl of three. Grew up in the kitchen. Cooking was like a way for me to get out of my chores. Nice. It was awesome. I was a super smart kid, and I'm pretty sure that I have killed those brain cells. I went to Texas A&M in their biomedical science program. Where, where are those brain cells right now? And I didn't like it. I thought that I had difficulty like reading and comprehending. I thought that like all kids have that growing up. Not all kids have that. The one thing that I missed was cooking. I thought I was going to be an artist. It didn't really work out very well. I went to school. I went to the Art Institute of Houston. Now I think it's like the International Art Institute of International Cuisine. If it's still around, I have no idea. I went back down to Texas because I made some really good friends down there. I came back to Kansas City 14, 15 years ago. Opened up the little catering company and um, private events in the castle. Uh, worked our way to be like a social club. Lots of wine dinners and beer dinners. And it was great. And I was headed in the right direction where I wanted to go. Economy collapsed. That kind of changes things. No more dispensable income. So I decided to open up a and that was open for five years, and we just closed it. Uh, so it was a cool. It's been a cool location. Why? Why the castle? What? What brought you to the castle? Oh, well, it's a cool venue for events. It's, just, it's, it's historic. It's I mean, it's beautiful piece yeah. of property. So um, I was just like, okay, why not? It's a castle. <laughs> uh, Mr. Kane and built it. He's a Belgian immigrant. And it just has it just has a lot of history for a lot of different people. It's been bars, nightclubs, homes, stuff. So it has a lot of story with it. What was something that was like really inspired you to uh, be a chef? So my grandma on my mom's side was a baker. Like she always baked stuff. We, we would go over to her house and she would probably have like four or five different desserts just hanging out on the counter. You know, like multi level cakes and a couple of pies and always fresh baked cookies and things like that. My mom always cooked. So I thought that like all kids got breakfast cooked for them and like a really cool lunch and then a homemade <laughs> snack and then, you know, a homemade dinner. So it was pretty cool. It's always been really easy. It's always just been really easy for me to do and I enjoy it. And then while I was down at Texas A&M, being that smart kid, bonfire fell. And it's this huge thing that they do that's like, gosh, what is it, six, eight, ten stories tall? Right. And it's for the um, game against Texas University. And Bonfire fell, and they couldn't find my friends who know how to help. And so I asked, I was like, what do you guys need, what do you guys need? And they hadn't eaten these days. So my girlfriends and I uh, pulled our money, made some lasagna, and for the first time in days, all of these men, young men and women, like sat around and ate nutritious food that was completely silent. And so for me, that was it. That was my contribution. Like I, I was able to help them go out and find my friends. And that was like, wow, food is super powerful. Yeah. Pretty awesome. So shortly thereafter, that's when I decided to go to culinary school. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't. You know, I've been on national TV a couple of times, and so people always assume that I came to the chefing world to, like, get famous. Uh, that was far from the truth. Right. <laughs> yeah, sometimes at first you don't, you're not really looking for that, but it just kind of comes along, you know? And yeah. That's what I love about the culinary world. You never know who you're going to meet. Yeah, and it's endless. You can always learn. Um, it's just kind of fun. So uh, what, is, what has been like one of your main struggles that you were able to overcome or, you know, something like? My main struggle, well, currently, I'm getting a little old. Um, you know, I, I do the farm-to-table thing, um, and I still do it well, even though the restaurant is 
explode. Um, that was interesting to figure out um, how to order from all the farmers mm -hmm. and also how to not rely on one farm for all produce or even one farm for all of your beef. The farmer could wake up and something disastrous happened overnight and you're out of your product. Right. At one point I was ordering from about 14 different farmers every single week um, and it was just kind of a nice steady um, process of ordering. Right. And so teaching that theory has been a little bit difficult. Sure. But um, it just made sense to me. Because you want to, do you want to pass that along to people that you work with? Or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because um, you know it's it's a lot different than uh, picking up the phone and calling one person for all of your items. It's a lot different. You know, there's yeah. an and plus when you order from a farmer, you're ordering from the person who grows your stock. Yeah. And so it's a different type of um, relationship and whole. Yeah. You know, I mean, these are the people that are out on the field. Um, it's not a salesperson that you're talking to. So it's, um, it's a different language to develop. And right. it's a much different relationship. And some chefs uh, like it, and other chefs don't have time for it. Yeah, that's so true. And that's okay. I mean, that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Um, but I definitely have time for it. Like, I think that's kind of part of the community. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, and sustainability. It's like, it's like that human thing, too. I have a, I have an original story, especially being a chefy chef. Like 12 years ago, going on 12 years ago, I was really sick, had migraines every day, vertigo, couldn't walk. Um, I gained like 40 pounds. Nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. So I'm in the hospital. I was in the hospital for about a week. They were trying to figure, they were trying to figure it out, and nobody could figure it out. Uh, I spent a year and a half visiting the top doctors in our country. And I came home uh, with zero results, except for while well, you're having difficulty walking, so here's a wheelchair that you could like just live in now. It's awesome. You know, I was I was 24, 25, something like that, and something just told me like, no, that's that's not an option. So I went to a naturopath, and she did muscle testing for food allergies and a whole bunch of other stuff, which I had never experienced it whatsoever. You know, my train of thought has, until that point, had always been very conventional medicine and very Western medicine. Um, but I was so, I felt so horrible that there had to be a different alternative. So um, I went and she discovered I had a bunch of food allergies and I had an overgrowth, like a very serious overgrowth of candida, which is a natural bacteria that's found in your gut anyway, it just kind of got yeah. out of hand. Um, and, and sometimes that happens with like too many antibiotics, and I was down in Houston for a long time. I, man, I got sick down there. I think that my body doesn't like Houston. I was bit by fire ants and on antibiotics so many times after that whole entire episode. So anyway, that's a sidebar. So naturopath, after she got finished with me, put me on a extremely strict diet. It was very clean. Um, and she said, you know, I'll see you in about a month, but you know, in two weeks, I felt 60% better. Like I could walk on my own. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. And then in about a month, I was probably 90% better. I only had a migraine once a week and of every day. I came back and I saw her and she was super pleased with um, the results and I said well what do I do you know can I start adding foods back in and she's like oh no no you can't you're gonna eat like this for a while until you get 100 percent and stay at 100 percent for about six months I did it and I was not only better but I was thriving like my brain was clear uh, my skin cleared up um, I lost a whole bunch of weight. It was just, it was just awesome. It was an amazing transformation because of food. And here we, we work with food all the time. Yeah. And nobody ever taught me the powerful influence that food had. That was something that hit me pretty hard. So six months is over with. I think just about six months. And I go back in. I'm like, so can I add some food back in? You know, <laughs> like what's going on? 
And she was like, you can if you want to, but I'm going to tell you probably not. And I said, well, then what do I do? I'm a chef. I cook for a living. Like, I have to handle these, this food. And um, she said, well, you already have that basic training, right? So you can turn anything you want to into those familiar flavors. Right. Like, uh, I use beef for a marinara instead of tomatoes. Like, that type of stuff. Because I already have that knowledge in my brain. Um, and I said, okay, well, are there any guidelines that I should follow? And she said, know where your food comes from yeah. and eat seasonally. So was it a, like a nightshade type of thing? Totally nightshade. Um, and then there are some others like cherries, peaches, um, oranges. Um, there's just some couple. And I'm sensitive to cow dairy and sensitive to wheat. I'm allergic to coffee. Do you know how bad that sucks? <laughs> you stuff and you're allergic to coffee. So um, it was great. So after she told me that, I just sought out all the farmers and I would talk to them about how they grow, how they treat the soil, um, you know, what they grow best. Because if they have, um, if they have a good time growing that food, something tells me that it's going to be a little bit better for my body. That's a yeah. little bit like woo woo wee, but I'm totally in it. Yeah. And I'm totally throwing it for like all local farmers. Their food just tastes better. Well, and yeah, and it doesn't travel as far. Exactly. And you know, there's there's all different types of food um, to meet the needs of all the people in America and in other countries. So, and I'm grateful for it. Like we're at a point right now in in history that we get to pick between like. 12 different types of carrots. Right. You know, from our farmer at the grocery store, organic, non organic, colored, short, long, whatever it is. Whereas, you know, 100 years ago, that was unheard of. Right. So we're sitting in a pretty cool space right now with food um, where people have choice. And, you know, there's all this rigmarole of, um, you know, everybody should grow organic and everybody should do and should do. And it's all pointing at the fingers. And yeah, you know, in a perfect world, you know, our soil would be very well taken care of, um, but right now there's food for everyone. Yeah. You think like, do you think that we do kind of are going back in time to when people were growing more of their own food? I you think know? so. And I think, you know, and that's one way to totally control what you feed yourself and what you feed your baby. And um, it's also an interesting time because I think there's a misnomer for the general population that growing food is easy. Yeah. It's not easy. No, it takes oh, a lot of attention. It takes a lot of time and a lot of attention and you have to know your soil. Right. And so, yeah, go grow a couple of things and kind of figure it out and see that it, it does take work. Yeah. And maybe when they go to the farmer's market or when they go to the grocery store and they see the prices of food, maybe they'll be willing to spend a little bit more because they know what it takes. Right. You know? And that's changed. That's changed. So. The medicine is in the food. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely the medicine is in the food. And it's also with the person who grows it for you, too. Um, how do you feel that, like, new technology has affected your field of work? And, and what are some old things that you still use from the past, if, if any? I've always done things kind of old school. I don't cook anything in like bags. <laughs> for some reason, I think that that's like weird. Okay, so the combination oven is amazing. I still don't know how to use it. At the place where I was training, we got a combi oven and it was a huge computer thing. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. But you know, it cooks it faster, and there's some improvements in that type of stuff. You know, all I know is that when I was a kid, my mom had a pressure cooker going, and sometimes oh, that man. was not really good news. <laughs> right, right. Like, a crock pot could be good or a bad thing, depending on what was inside of it. Yeah, and um, there's something to be said about um, planning in that, especially in the winter months, when you have to cook something over a long period of time, oh, yeah. um, there's there's just something about it where you can smell it for days yeah. and days and kind of tend to it. And, um, and there's just something about it that I, I will never, I will never walk away from. Absolutely. So I, I really enjoy it. And as far as like, using chemicals to cook, I don't, I'm not, that's not my cup of tea. I'm sure there's some pretty cool stuff out there you can really do with it. Sure. 
Right. I'm not an expert at it. So. <laughs> I mean, you're obviously using techniques that have been used for like hundreds of years. Yeah, and you know, I'm a purist in that right, that's for sure. What is, what's your favorite kind of foods? Uh, I'm a meat girl. Yeah? Yeah, give me some meat. Do you like rabbit? People think that that's like horrible for me to admit that I like rabbit. I think that they're beautiful creatures and they're amazing. Yeah. I think they have to be really good. Him a beef eater. The, the ribeye has that cap steak on top of it, and that's like my favorite piece. You can cut that out and um, it's the juiciest, most flavorful steak in the world. Yeah. Uh, other than that, sauces. I really enjoy sauces because they can like make or break a dish. You can pull it all together or freaking yank it apart. I am notorious for uh, doing like too much to my food or add, not too much to my food, like adding way too many um, components to a plate. Well, I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah, some people like these like highly composed dishes and yeah. some people figure out how to do that same thing with the simple techniques. And I guess that's kind of the thing that I've been learning a lot about recently is just how to create beauty with simplicity, you know, it's like really what I'm into. Yeah, and well, if you start with those great ingredients, then nine times out of ten, they just kind of speak for you. Absolutely. And you don't need to do a lot, which is kind of nice. So you got any uh, future endeavors that, that you, uh, like big plans for the future? Or? When do I not have them? <laughs> um, let's see here. So we have a show that we're working on. Um, it's on every Sunday. And that's been really fun because we get to talk to farmers and um, chefs and really shine a spotlight on people in the Midwest. So in season two, we're going to head out to Western Kansas and kind of tap into not only urban farms and gardens and small farmers, uh, we get to tap into like the big guys too. So the large commodity farmers, um, also uh, like a huge uh, hog ranch we're going to go to just to kind of sh see the other perspective of our food system. Sure. Yeah. So that's pretty fun. Um, I do a line of uh, therapeutic horse treats. That's right. Horse treats um, that are going really well. See? So I am. Oh, nice. Beautiful. It's like a carrot. Who would not love that? Who would not <laughs> love this? All owners should love that for their horses. But um, it has. You know, tur it has a bunch of turmeric and beet and apple, and they're all organic ingredients. That's beautiful. Um, so we do that, and then um, bone broth for dogs and cats. Nice. So there's always. And now, again, what is your what is your TV show like? What do you KC? It is the KCWE Sundays okay. at 8:30, so it's an affiliate of Channel 9. Perfect. Yeah, and we're we're having fun with it. Um, having a lot of fun and meeting people with the same type of passions about food is pretty cool. So if someone wanted to like find you on social media, what would you, rec what would you recommend? I'm you? all over it. Yeah. All over it. Um, it's going to be, my personal chef is um, Chef Renee Kelly Harvest. Mm -hmm. And then um, the show is Harvest with Renee Kelly. So Harvest, Renee Kelly, you should find me. Yeah. Like period. Perfect. If there's a chef in there someplace. <laughs> well, it'll be fine too. But yeah, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, uh, Snapchat. I'm new to Snapchat. I don't really know if I like. I'm not it sure if I'm gonna go with it. I don't. I'm I don't sure. really know. Um, apparently, it's the new thing, and yeah. it has been the new thing, and it's not going away. I really wish it would go away. Uh, but yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I Instagram more than I do anything else. Yeah. Let me do it that way. Cool. So yeah. So alternate reality question. What? All right. Okay. If, if this was like a total, total another place in time, and it could be anything. Oh, I could be. You can be anything, anyways. Like even if it was super crazy powers or something like that. Well, of course I would have all the superhero powers. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to fly? Um, I think. Um, ooh, I'm gonna go conservative with this one. If I had to go all, if I had to go back to when I did um, biomedical science, I think I would have skipped over biomedical science and went to like chiropractic, naturopathic, things like that, and looked at food as medicine and become kind of.
kind of like a, a healer shoppy shop. I don't know. Girl, all girl on my own stuff, you know, having the yeah. That's cool. probably what I do. Um, as long as I can fly. I don't want extra. Food. That's a very nobody excellent added you know, <laughs> being a food doctor. Yeah, nobody needs extra vision. <laughs> really. You can fly your medicine to your people. There you go. Um, and it would be great. Uh, who's your friend? This is Jessica. Food? Jessica, say hi. Hi. Hi, Jessica. Um, we are getting ready for uh, a demo on Fox 4, so we do a lot of that. Nice. Yeah. Um, and she's my awesome person who puts together my demos to a T. Uh, don't you, Dad? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, partner in crime. <laughs> yes, she's my partner in crime. Well, I would love to like revisit you like in the later summer after you've got a bunch of food uh, yeah. and stuff around you and get to talk to all your farmers and. Also, going to be doing um, a big dinner with farmers, and we'd love to have you out for that. That would be awesome. It's I love me some farmers. Just a just a food eater and appreciator. Yeah. So yeah. Thank, thank you again for being on our first podcast. You are well. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much. You know, hopefully your next person isn't stuck icing cookies. Hey, it's you all could good. do some like fancy stuff with them, yeah. but yeah. Know. <laughs> it might be some wilderness guy like taking yeah. a part of deer or something. Who knows? Okay. Um, that would be interesting. I've yeah. never done that before, but yes, that would be interesting. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank See you later.